Welcome to Sore Mag's Writer Cafe, where we share the real writer's life over a cup of friendship sprinkled with laughter and wisdom. My name is LaShonda Hoffman, and I'm your host for today. Today's sponsor is Finding Joy in the Journey, a 90-day devotional. Today, I am sitting here chatting with my friend, Laura Schmidt. She is here to discuss her books, talk about her writing, talking about promotion, all kind of good stuff. So, Laura, please tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and tell us about your current book, and hopefully give us some excerpts. Okay. Thank you, Lashonda. Uh, my name is Laura Stewart Schmidt, and I write mysteries, and my current book is Don't Fear My Darling. It's kind of a domestic suspense about a young woman who goes to work as a live-in secretary for a famous author and becomes convinced that somebody in the author's family is trying to harm the old woman. And I'd love to read the folks an excerpt. Uh, This is from a scene in the middle when Louisa, the main character, has interrupted somebody, she thinks, trying to get into her employer, Marguerite's, room in the middle of the night. And she doesn't know if it's Marguerite's daughter-in-law or one of her two adult grandchildren. The entire family is suspect. Finally, someone was holding Tamara accountable. If Jenna were like this all the time, Tamara would act a lot less loony. I told you, I came down to the kitchen for some cake, and I heard all this commotion, and when I came back upstairs, Louisa was yelling at me. Why do you let her treat me like crap? Are you scared to tell her to act like the other servants? You wouldn't let Carol accuse me of stupid stuff. I wondered if the maid would even have the nerve to tell Jenna if Tamara did anything to her. Louisa does not treat you like crap, Jenna said. She seems to go out of her way to be friendly despite your rudeness. And if Carol did accuse you of anything, it would hardly surprise me. Your behavior is not only rude, it's crazy, Tamara interrupted. Is that what you're going to tell me? I'm crazy? Mom, I'm not the crazy one. Louise is not safe here. I had to muffle laughter. You would know. Safe from what? Jenna snapped. I think grandmother is poisoning her mind. Silence. I leaned closer, checking the floor and wall to make sure I wasn't casting a shadow. Joel said something, and all I heard was, tell Mom. Fortunately, Tamara didn't have the volume control he did. I think Grandmother's convincing Louisa there's something wrong with us, that it's our idea she's holed up in a room, like we chain her in there or something. Marguerite didn't have to do a thing. Does it bother you that your grandmother doesn't come downstairs anymore? Was it my imagination, or was Jenna smiling? Just a little. No, Tamara said, but I didn't put pliers in the elevator. Silence. I held my breath. I didn't tell them there were pliers in the elevator. Who did that, Mom? I didn't do it because I was in the hospital. And Joel says he didn't, and I believe him. That leaves you. Don't be silly. My heart pounded, and an itchy spot on my leg made me twitch. I couldn't scratch it. They'd hear me, or I wouldn't hear them, and I had to. Jenna, jamming the elevator, the last one I would suspect? That's all. You want to know what else happens, you have to buy the book. (laughs) All right. It sounds interesting. Makes you want to hit the buy button. Now, my question for you is, what inspired this story? Uh, As incredible as this is going to sound, I dreamed it. Um, What I actually dreamed was the climax. And in the climactic scene, um, I hope this won't be any kind of a spoiler alert, but there's a huge chandelier in the house that Louisa is staying in. And the dream I had involved Louisa, and it was her in the dream, sitting up on the chandelier trying to get away from the person who had been doing all the mayhem in the house up until that point. And once I had that, I had to go from there. I knew I had to create a character who actually could climb up in a chandelier and sit there. So that led to Louisa having to be a very petite gymnast and on and on and on. And, you know, one one thing leads to another. And that's the fun thing about writing is you come up with something that seems totally random and it inspires all kinds of other things. I think I like that. That's what I love about um, writing too. Um, Most of my stories do come from 
come from my dreams too. So I understand Please. that. Um, so my, my first question is, how are you dealing with the quarantine as a person and as a writer? Well, as a writer, um, I'm trying really hard uh, to use the time productively, and I have to admit that that has not been as easy as I might have hoped it would be. Um, and that's where how I'm dealing with it as a person comes in. I think as a person, a lot of us are feeling anxious right now. You know, the world has changed, and it changed overnight. And we don't know if it's ever going to go back to what we remember. And silly things that we used to take for granted, being able to watch a ball game, go to a hockey game, go to a concert, none of those things are the way they used to be. And the, the uncertainty and the not knowing um, can mess with your mind if you don't, uh, you know, allow yourself time to <laughs> take a few deep breaths and decompress sometimes. So it, it's really interesting to me. Um, in the latest issue of Writer's Digest, the editor had a little note on her introductory page where she said, quarantine is not a writing retreat. And she went on to give all of us writers permission not to be as creative and productive now as we thought or hoped we would be. And the funny thing is, is that as soon as she said that, I felt better. And I sat down and started my next book, which is called Unspeakable, and is about a speech and language pathologist who is trying to treat an orphan 10-year-old who has selective mutism. I think that... Um a lot of people thought that the quarantine would be like a writer's retreat. But um, I know for myself, the first two months, I was in cuckoo land. My mind just was not focusing on writing. I was, I was worried about what, you know, how I'm going to provide for my family. So um, you really couldn't think about that. Once I realized that I was going to be okay, then I could calm my mind down to focus on writing. So it, it still hasn't become a writer's retreat, but it's gotten a little better than that. Exactly. I think we're kind of finding our way out of the woods. And what we need to tell the listeners here is to give yourself permission to feel what you're feeling. Be kind to yourself. If all you want to do is sit down and binge watch your favorite TV show, do it. You've got the perfect excuse now. You know, um, I, I'm, I'm rattled about things and watching whatever program is taking my mind off it. Then do it. God doesn't mind. In fact, that might be why he gave you that TV show in the first place. It would be mm -hmm. wonderful if we were all writing, um, and a lot of us are. I've got a friend who's cranking out a new YA novel, more power to her. Um, but, you know, if, if they're not doing it, it's okay. Whatever you're doing to get through this is the right thing for you. That's good advice, very good advice. So I want to talk about your writing journey. I know you had a bumpy road writing journey, kind of similar to me. So I would love for you to share when you started writing and when you actually got published as a writer. Oh, my goodness. Well, I hope I don't discourage anybody. Actually, I hope this is very encouraging. Um, Winston Churchill once said, never, 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 ever, ever give up. And he was right. Don't give up because you never know. Um, I started writing when I was 11. And the minute I sat down and wrote my first story, I knew that's what I wanted to do. Um, unfortunately, I was a very unfocused child, uh, probably had some sort of undiagnosed learning disability back in the 70s. They didn't talk about things like that. And you were expected to do your work. And school was difficult for me. Really, the only classes I enjoyed and did well in were English and social studies. I didn't go to college until I was 40 years old. Um, so learning to write was a long journey. And I sent my, the first novel that I wrote out to a publisher, um, actually a lot of publishers, when I was about 25. And it was a young adult mystery about a girl who goes up to Cape Cod to visit her brother and sister-in-law. And uh, there are a lot of mysterious goings on there. When I've read the book since then as an adult, I think it's a very good book for a 25-year-old. But 
becoming a writer is not being a hockey player. Um, you know, if, if, you're, if you're playing for the Blues, you're going to peak in your 30s, early 30s probably, late 20s, early 30s. But writing, the joy of being a writer is that you, look, you get better by doing it, you get better by reading, you get better by studying your craft, and you will always be better as you move on. Um, I allowed myself to get discouraged when I couldn't sell the first two books. Um, amazingly, the second book I tried to sell was an early draft of Don't Fear My Darling, which has since gotten published. I'm glad I didn't sell that one because this one is so much better. Um, the ending of the first one was, was, was just dreadfully depressing. And I didn't think it was at the time, but having lived the life I've lived, Louisa has to make a very important decision at the end of the book that she makes a better decision now. She makes a decision that I think makes her a kinder, gentler human being than I allowed her to be when I wrote about her at 26. So the more life you live, the better you get as a writer. Um, having said that, you've got to be prepared for a lot of ups and downs. My first book was published, or it was accepted for publication when I was 51. That's 40 years after I started writing. And it was a young adult contemporary. And um, unfortunately, uh, there were some glitches with the publisher. And uh, they ended up publishing an unedited version. When I saw it, three weeks after it had already been out, I asked them if they would fix it. I got no response. Um, I was forced to hire an attorney and get my rights back from them. And I never did anything else with the book, and I just moved on and started writing something else. And my next book um, was a uh, um, young adult mystery called Until Proven Innocent. And the funny thing is, I had Don't Fear My Darling and Until Proven Innocent out to publishers at the same time, and they got accepted within three weeks of each other. So I had two books come out at the same time. So. You know, uh, not to, not to get uh, spiritual on the folks or anything, but God's time is different from our time. And sometimes you just have to let things work by his time because he knows what he's doing. I'm glad you said that because I know you had a hard time with it and you kept thinking that it was never going to happen. And, I, and you know, I'm the encourager. Yes, it will. Let's just give it time. <laughs> you know, yeah, so and I, we're right. I was really excited that it, and then you got a double blessing. You got two books instead of one. So, you know, it's just a matter of, of waiting until you until the book finds the right place to land. And that's the hard part as a writer is, is waiting. The waiting is very hard. And if you start at a young age, you find you're very discouraged because you see everybody else moving forward and you're not. And so... I do, uh, re I do um, encourage those who have been writing, if you've been writing more than 10 years, to continue. Um, yeah. You grow with each year, you learn more with each year. And um, one of my favorite authors told me that I wasn't going to know anything until I was 40. At that time, I think I was like 28. <laughs> I'm not ready I'm not to hear so that. <laughs> yeah, I was like 40. Oh my God! But um, <laughs> I, she was right. I, I tell her that all the time, and she's like, "I don't even remember telling you that." I said, "Yes, yeah, you told me that, but it's stuck in my head because as I start getting nearer to 40, I'm like, when is it gonna happen? God is not happening yet. I'm almost 40, <laughs> you know. But I learned so much. I took classes, um, mm -hmm. you know, and uh. I learned that it's about patience. It's about uh, enjoying the experience as you go. If you rush it, you're going to miss everything, you know, exactly. and then you're going to get that big head that, oh, I'm all <laughs> this, when when it was just a fluke, you know. Right. And it's a Perfect. bunch of people out here are one book, one book wonders, and that's it. And if you want to have a career with this, you want more than one book. So, you know, yeah, enjoy the enjoy the journey. Now, oh, we amen. have a guest that popped in. I'm glad he was able to get on, uh, Mr. Kevin Eastman. Hello, Kevin. 
Hello, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I'm glad you were able to join us. So we're going to let you tell us a little bit about who you are, what you write, and uh, give us a quick uh, excerpt. Oh, wonderful. Well, my name is Kevin E. Eastman, and I always emphasize my middle name, my middle initial. And the reason I do that is because the uh, the the creator of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is also named Kevin Eastman, and that's obviously not me. So, <laughs> so I, I always put that in there. So I always use my middle initial professionally. But uh, what I what I have is a um, I'm a, a self development. I like to call my book self development uh, book author. I don't like to use the word self help because people have stigmas about that. So what I use is uh, self development. My my title of my book is actually it's called Don't Gamble on Life Improvement Until You Shift the Odds. And a lot of people are thrown off with the word gamble in the title because they think that it, it's about gambling addiction and it's so totally not. It's about uh, discovering what's inside of you and developing it to make your life better. And I use my personal experience to uh, to kind of go, and what I do with my book is I use uh, a series of topics that I think uh, contribute most to the chaos that we that we encounter in life, and kind of make make the complicated uncomplicated to make it easier to to understand. So what I do is uh, I talk about topics like relationships. I talk about uh, the comfort zone. I talk about uh, peer pressure, I talk about perception, all of those things that I experienced in my life, and I had to do some soul searching because life wasn't going the way that I wanted it to go, and I had to figure out why it wasn't going the way I planned, and that was a hard thing for me to do because I uh, ended up having to find out things about myself that I didn't necessarily like, but I had to find those things out in order to make adjustments. Okay, can so you read the answer? Oh, absolutely. Uh, what I, I actually, I just pulled up, a, I, I read your email, and I, I pulled up an excerpt from Chapter 4 uh, of my book. It's called A Fear of Winning. And before I read the expert, I would like, before I read the excerpt, I would like to un- let people understand that uh, the majority of my, my book, is the titles of our metaphors for uh, a, a deeper meaning on that. So uh, Fear of Winning is not what people think it is. It's like, how are you afraid of winning? Well, you're actually not. But what I what I did with that book, is, what I did with that chapter, is basically kind of talk about how a person is so afraid of success that they will intentionally sabotage themselves. So, uh, what, with that, I'm going to read an excerpt from that chapter. Uh, it says, "Everyone has a desire to win. Not everyone is prepared to win. It isn't easy to spot the light at the end of the tunnel, but it is there." Success is yours for the taking, but it's not going to be handed to you. It takes a, an enormous amount of courage to change the course of your life in order to obtain success, but it can be done. You must be willing to go over, under, around, or even through any obstacle that happens to be blocking your path to it. Think about this. Everything you want to achieve in life is located on the other side of fear, pride, and self-doubt. The things you need are the motivation, the methods, and the tools to get you over there. So with that, I, what I try to do with that is change the person's, uh, the, change the person's mindset because that's what it took for me to get over some of the obstacles I had been, been encountering throughout my life. And it took a very good mentor that I had to, um, to make me see that. You know, he asked me a simple question, and I had no answer to him. Uh, he asked me, I've seen you blame everybody and everything for the misfortunes in your life. Have you ever looked in the mirror? And I was stumped because I had never done that. And that's the whole point of my book, to get the reader to look and develop a what I call an inside-out mentality. Because what we do as people is we, when we see something that goes wrong for us, we automatically start looking for outside causes. And, and it's nothing, nothing bad. It's just the way we do. It's because of that is why this thing is occurring to me. But what I do is I start looking at what place did I have in this? What role did I have in this occurring to me? And what I found out was startling. I found out that 95% of my problems were 
were object were were obstacles that I actually created in my head. It wasn't necessarily what was going on outside. It was going on what was inside. And once I learned to do that, I, I found that a lot of my, my situations, obstacles, what have you, they were not as big as I was making them. And that's the whole point of my book. <laughs> that's good because I think that we talked about it before, but I think that mindset will stop you in your tracks and you don't even realize it. You know, you like you say, you're blaming everybody else except the man in the mirror. You know, so. absolutely, absolutely, and that's what that's what he was saying to me. And I had it took me a while to figure it out. And yes, it was uncomfortable. I didn't want to face it and all of those things. But what you real, what I found that we make things larger than they need to be. If you take it in in steps and break the the actual the the actual obstacle down into uh, what I call sub goals, it's easier to achieve the overall goal. And it, and it depends on your mindset. Um, the, your perception controls a lot. It's going to control the magnitude of your reaction to it. And what I, what I talk about in Chapter 5, which is uh, the title of it is the, the glass half empty or half full, which is your perception. And I use a very simple uh, scenario, and, but it makes so much sense. If a person balls up a piece of paper and tosses it at you and you see them do that, your natural reaction is to swat it out of the way without even thinking about it because it's a piece of paper. Now, if you take that same scenario and you run it a second time, but instead of paper, substitute a bowling ball, your reaction is going to be completely different. Why? Because of you've already imagined the damage a bowling ball can do if it hits you. But from a scientific standpoint, the, object, the task remains the same. Stop the object from hitting you. Now, if you think about it that way, you can use the same swatting motion that you use for the paper ball for the bowling ball. The only difference is it's going to take more force to swat a bowling ball. <laughs> hmm, I like this. That's an interesting, interesting way to look at it. Now, of, now, of course, of course, I, w I would expect people to move out of the way. I wouldn't expect you to, to swat a bowling ball. But if you look at it from a scientific standpoint, you can use the same, the same action to accomplish the mission, which is stopping the object from hitting you. But because of how we think of things, we are naturally going to move out of the way of a bowling ball where we'll just swat a paper ball out of the way with no problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So my first question for today was, how are you dealing with the quarantine as a person and as a writer? Well, as, as a person, I'm doing what we can do. You know, you, you're taking the precautions and those types of things. Uh, it's, it's difficult because you, you have to get used to a, a quote-unquote new normal <laughs> um, of the way of doing things. But, I mean, it, it, you you are you, – you you make adjustments, you know, you can only, I, I'm, I have a big philosophy, I don't worry about things I have no control over. And it makes it easier for me to deal with those things, unfortunately, for a lot of people, because we like to, because people in general, like to let their emotions make their decisions for them, it becomes a lot larger than it is. You know, but, I mean, it's a hard thing to do, and I try to tell people that in my book, I read my book, it, you have to get your emotions under control. But the problem is when other people around you are letting their emotions run free, you appear not to care when you actually do care. You just are looking at it in a systematic way. You're looking at it in a logical way. So those things, that's um, what I'm dealing with. As a writer, um, it's – it's difficult because I can't get out into, you know, into the public and speak with people uh, face to face, you know, to, so they can get the, the uh, they can see the emotion that I'm, when I'm reading my book or talking about my book and those types of things, they can only hear my voice on through podcasts like this one and uh, reading interviews and what have you. So it's real, it's, it, it, it poses some challenges as far as that goes, but the, uh, again, I always look at things kind of logical. You know, my dad tells me that my, my logic is my biggest asset, but it can also be my biggest downfall because everybody doesn't use logic. But, I mean, it's, everything happens for a reason. The, 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 the thing is, if we can 
accept the reason it's happening, and a lot of people can't. They, they try to control the narrative, and that's where they make their mistake. That is so true. That is so true. Uh, that's, I think the biggest issue is that we're so used to being in control that, you know, telling me, ah, uh, you got to stay inside is like, what? Uh, how can you tell me what to do? You know, right. that's a big but, issue I mean, if, if, with if, this if, quarantine. If, 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 it, yes, but a lot of people, they, they, they want to, I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And mm-hmm. I get that to a certain degree. But you also have to, you know, I hear a lot of people say, you know, it, it is what it is. True, but you have experts that are in place that are telling you one thing. You go do something else, and then when it goes wrong, you want to complain. Well, you didn't listen to the person that was telling you not to go outside, you know. <laughs> right. You, 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 don't, you don't get to cry about being a victim when your actions actually cause the circumstances. True. <laughs> true. That is so true. <laughs> All right. We are going to do our little break, and then we'll come right back to some, good, some more questions. So uh, our sponsor today is Finding Joy in the Journey, a 90-day devotional. Have you ever found it hard to find joy amid trials and adversity where you're not alone? 94 phenomenal co-authors give real talk about love, loss, grief, and healing in Finding Joy in the Journey. In her 11th anthology, Finding Joy in the Journey, Vanessa Blackwell brings together authors who share their personal growth stories and how they have found joy in the journey. Through these stories, each author demonstrates that while education, money, and professional achievement can certainly play a role, true joy goes deeper than material possessions and accomplishments. Every journey is unique. No two people's journey to joy will be exactly alike, but we can all learn from each other. Get ready to laugh and cry, sometimes on the same page, after reading this book. You will walk away feeling inspired to find joy in your journey and power through any obstacles you may encounter along the way. Check the show notes for the link to order your copy. Welcome back to Sormaz Writers Cafe. Today I am chatting with Kevin E. Eastman and Ms. Laura Smith, and I want to say thank you for being here. Um... Thank you for having us. Thank you. All right. So I'm trying to see which question I want to ask. I have so many I wanted to say about. Um, Hold on. Okay, let's ask this question. What did you learn while you were writing your book? Oh, my goodness. (laughs) That's, I could talk about that for quite a while, so I would like to let Kevin go first. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I, can, I could talk about it for a while, too, but um, <laughs> good, I'll, I'll condense it. Um, what did I learn from writing my book? My book was completely therapeutic for me. It, really? was, it actually gave me a chance to reflect on some of the, the lessons that I had been taught throughout my life from at various stages, but had chosen to ignore them to a degree. So having to write these, these uh, chapters out, because I wrote, I wrote 10 chapters, basically. It, it's 12 chapters in all, but one is an introduction, one is a summary. So in the middle of that, I had to write a number of chapters, and rereading my book as a reader and not as a writer brought all of those memories back. So it actually helped me um, writing those things out, and it, it gave me an, an excitement when I when I talk with people because I can relate to ninety five percent or ninety eight percent of everything that a person reads in my book. I have experienced. So it's like when people say, well, what makes you an expert? Well, I live this stuff, and here's what I did to to uh, overcome these obstacles, and here is my result. You can take it or you can leave it, either one. But I'm telling you that this stuff works for me. 
So it actually helped me out quite a bit in, in my my uh, presentation to groups when I talk with people, when I talk with uh, potential readers about my book. It gives me that, that option to talk off the cuff, so to speak, because this is my experience. It, it wasn't something I read in a book or a theory. <laughs> Good for you. <sighs> what about you, Laura? Well, I know that with uh, Don't Fear My Darling, I made the decision to set it in Seattle, Washington. And when I wrote the first draft, because remember I had said earlier that I wrote an original draft in about 1986 or so. I, I didn't say the year, but that's when it was. It was 86 or 87. And I had never been there. So I had to do a lot of research on a part of the country I had never seen. And Further, I decided that I wanted my main character to have a, an interesting background that would enable her to have the sort of attachment to her elderly employer that is necessary for her to want to do this job and be, and be very successful at it. And so she became part Native American uh, because in a lot of Native American cultures, um, they are very... Uh, respectful of their elders and of what the elders have to offer. And so this is something that is a real source of conflict with her throughout the book is uh, the fact that her employer's family treat her so shabbily and cruelly, in fact, in Louise's eyes. And she doesn't understand why they feel this way about her. And so, of course, not being Native American myself, um, the research that I did, uh, we're, we're not talking sitting down and watching a PBS documentary. Um, my husband and I joined the American Indian Society. They knew we were straight up 100% European white people. They welcomed us anyway. Um, there were things that, you know, they, they let us into gently, but we were invited and welcome to participate fully. We belonged to the society for years, and we went to the festivals, and we went to their get-togethers, and we got to know people, and we listened to the stories, and we, we really enjoyed being there. I mean, it was, it, was, it was a learning experience. It was a friendship experience for us, and in addition to that, I also had a friend who had some... It, it, I believe it was a grandparent who had been part Native American, and he would tell me stories for hours. He had artifacts in his cabin where he lived out in the middle of the country, and he would explain all these things to me. And I listened, and I read, and I learned. And I'm not going to say that I know everything or that I didn't make any mistakes whatsoever, but I'm going to say that my character and her family and her heritage are portrayed as absolutely authentically and respectfully as is possible for me to do. And I had a blast writing that story. I learned so much. Even if I had never gotten it published, just the time I spent with the people, um, the trip that I ultimately made to Seattle to scope out the area. And, you know, by then I'd already basically written the book. But you get a few little details to throw in and give it a little bit more pizzazz. So, you know, not, nothing quite as, as uh, life-changing as what Kevin is talking about, but when you write <laughs> fiction, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to, to expand yourself as a person and to hope that you can do that for your reader as well. Uh, maybe my reader can travel vicariously to some place they haven't seen or learn about a culture that they don't know much about. And then I've done something more than just entertain them. Okay. Great, great. That's wonderful. Thank you. What is the biggest surprise that you experienced after you became a published writer? Biggest surprise? Um, at, well, I mean, for it, it sounds a bit cliche -ish for me, but uh, a lot of people, uh, are they automatically think that you, when you become a writer, that it becomes a bestseller instantly. <laughs> and you have, you have this enormous amount of money, and it's like, uh, no, I'm not what? even no? close, you know. <laughs> it, 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 it's a it's a tough sale, and and with my genre, you know, a lot I have to overcome what I call the ice. 
I have to break through the ice that a potential reader may have. When they automatic when they hear my book and what they hear it's about, they automatically get into a defensive mode for the for the most part. And and they go, Oh, if there's nothing wrong with me, I don't need your book. Well, there was nothing wrong with me until I found out there was. So it, it's one of those it, it, you're constantly having to prove that that it it may be something you need, you know, and that's the way I wrote my book. I actually wrote it in a sense that I didn't want the reader to think I, they were reading a book. I wanted the reader to think they were having a conversation with me. Now, given it's a one-sided conversation because they're reading my words and I'm not there to actually talk to them, but I wrote the book in the manner of which I'm speaking directly to the person reading the book. So that kind of gives it a degree of realism. So for me, the challenge for being a published author, it, once they hear what my book is about, it is constantly proving that I know what I'm talking about. And I, I always emphasize, well, this is my experience, so it, it makes me an expert on my experience. I know exactly what I'm talking about because I did it. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I have experienced that, so I understand. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like so that that's that's to get them that's, to see that they kinda, really do need it. <laughs> yes, that that that's the hard part. And and mm-hmm. for me, I think overcoming the ice, I call it the ego, because that is that is our protection. You know, as as a human being, your ego is your 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 comfort zone. You know, but once you learn to step outside of your comfort zone, is when personal growth occurs. And I even mentioned that in the book. I tried it. I pulled a person in in the first chapter explaining to them that I was this person that was uh, facing adversity and had no way to overcome it. And here are some things that I did to overcome these obstacles, and here's the result. So I, I kind of, you know, have to break down that wall to let them know, hey, I, I've been where you are. <laughs> You know, this is not something I read in a book somewhere. And in, in fact, I actually um, I purposely stayed away from every self-help book that I could. I didn't want to read any of them because I wanted all of my ideas to come out of my head. <laughs> mm-hmm. That was good. That was good. It helps you sometimes to read other things than what you're writing. So, yes, that was good. Well, I I had to stay away from it because I didn't want a person to go, oh, his book is like Steve Harvey's book, Think Like a Man, Act Like a Woman. You know, I didn't want that. You know, I didn't want somebody to associate me with another person's book. I wanted people to go, oh, Kevin hit some good points in this book, and he didn't stop from beginning to end. That's the ultimate goal. (laughs) (laughs) What about you, Laura? Well, I think that what surprised me, um, now Don't Fear My Darling actually came out after the other book that was accepted at the same time, Until Mm -hmm. Proven Innocent. In fact, I think Until Proven Innocent was the second one accepted, but it came out within six months. Uh, No, it wasn't quite that soon. I'm sorry, I I misspoke. But it was was quite soon. And... um, I I think that both publishers handled things fairly professionally. Um, However, they are small presses. And one thing that I hadn't anticipated was the fact that when you're with a small press, you don't get a lot of support in terms of marketing, like you might get if you were with one of the big five. But then again, I've heard that even with the big five, you don't get a lot of support unless your last name is Grisham or King. So, you know, that could, that could be something that uh, I wouldn't be able to expect anyway. But um, I know that um, I, I had tried to set up book events with a couple of bookstores in town. And this is something that I did not realize. If a larger publisher with a marketing budget is working with an author, they will pay the bookstore a certain amount of money to host the event and they call those co-op dollars. That was a term I had no idea of. Now, if I'm with my little small press and they're not being offered co-op dollars, that money's got to come from somewhere because otherwise a little independent bookstore can't do it. Guess where the money's going to come from? 
You, mm-hmm. the author, are going to pay a $25 stocking fee for your books to be in their store. They also want to sell them on consignment. Now, what I figured out very quickly is that me as an author with a small press as opposed to a self-published author, number one, I do not set my price. Number two, I have to buy my author copies, and I do get a discount, but it's not 40%. And most little small bookstores who want to do consignment want to do a 40-60 split. They get 40, you get 60. And I have been forced to tell bookstores that I will lose money if I do their event because I, I don't get a 40% discount. So what you're looking at in that case, you either try to work with the bookstore to avoid the stocking fee, or maybe you change how you look at the whole thing. And you're not there to make a certain amount of money off each book. You're there for the exposure. So what else can you do while you're there? Is there anything you can do that will – I'm sorry, I've got a buzzing clock in the background. Um, what can you do that will uh, generate a little bit more interest for your book than you know, just sitting there and trying to sell copies and signing them? Um, what I found out, and, and LaShonda gets the credit for this, she told me if you go to, an, a, to an, a, like a flea market style event or someplace where you're sitting at a table trying to sell your books, you're competing with a bunch of other people who are also sitting there either selling their books or selling something else. And you've got to stand out. So what I found worked better for me than anything, and this was a real surprise. I didn't expect it to. But I did two Christmas bazaars last year, and I made themed gift baskets around each of my two books Bam, they sold out. Both of them did at both events. So sometimes you really have to get creative when you don't have a publisher putting marketing money behind you. Don't give up because you can't sell on consignment. Think of some other way to get what you want. That's interesting you would say that because I, I'm, I'm, at a dumb, I'm dumbfounded at what you did. It actually worked, and, and I've tried similar things, and it didn't work. I'm like, I'm offering people money, and they still don't want to buy the book. You know, it's like, wait a minute. I'm giving you, I'm giving you an opportunity to get free money. You know, I've, I've gotten gift cards and, and put it out there, and it's like all you have to do is buy a, buy a copy of the book, and you're going for a, a, a drawing for a $50 gift card card my book is only wow. sixteen dollars so it's like come on now it's like I'm giving you a chance at free money you don't want it really audience because people give away stuff it's all about what looks appealing to that reader you know people Absolutely. give gift cards all the time so it's like oh that's just a gift card whereas she did a, a, a you know a theme a theme a basket that was different she they could buy the right. basket for somebody else you know most of the time if you're just get, most people give out one gift card so what's the odds of that person winning you know yeah. i tell my clients all the time do do five you know or do enough where the people think they have a chance to win when you do whenever I, any any type of uh, contest that i enter I enter because I get more chances to win. If it's just right. one trip to Disney World, guess what? Nobody's going to enter that because then what's the odds? <laughs> but if you're giving right. out 10 trips to Disney World, okay, I won't enter that. You know, and so that's what you have to look at. What are the odds? Would you, would ask yourself that? Would I enter that? Would, oh, totally. Gonna, I, know, completely you know, like, I completely You know, you like you know, whereas you giving out a fifty dollar gift card. Give off a uh, five dollars. You'll be surprised how many people want that five dollars. <laughs> you know, you know what? I, you know, I, 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 think, I, think, you know what? I think I want to try that. Yeah, yeah and you, you get that. more. You get more people because they get it. They're like, oh, I get a chance to win. Versus one, you know, people give out. Oh, I'm giving out one Kindle. But if you're giving out ten Kindles, okay, you're going to get a swarmy of people because they they think, okay, I got a chance to win this. You know, you have to look at it from the. I always tell my clients, re, look at it from the reader's point of view. You are a reader. If a re, if you, would you do that? Would you buy that? You know, my, my, most people won't sign up for your newsletter just to to give them your email. So what, what are you going to entice them to get 
to get the email from you, oh, you know, right. and, and people don't think of that. They're like, I started my email list and nobody signed up. Well, what you giving them? Because, <laughs> you know, we don't want to give you something for free. You can give me nothing, you know, in return. Right. So you have to look right. at that. When you're, when you're trying to get people to do something to, you know, you got a table and all your stuff on your table is just that one book. I found that out the hard way. I had to go and get other things to sell on my table because maybe somebody already has my book. Well, what else can I offer them? <laughs> you know, right. so you have to always think about that person that's what I'm getting for my money because they, they want more. <laughs> sure. I, I get it. It was just kind of it, it was just kind of interesting because I did have a number of them. I had a number mm-hmm. of gift cards, and I'm like, I cannot believe that I had. And in that sense, I had one person apply, and mm-hmm. and, and naturally she won. And, and when mm-hmm. I sent it out, mm-hmm. and when I sent it to her, you know, and told everybody that I had that she had won, it, they went, Oh, you gave her that much. Oh yeah, you didn't get a copy of the book. You, what, you, what you thought I was playing, you know? Yes, they did. They thought you were playing. You giving it out. You know, we got, we got, a, we got the. I'm from the Shelby State of Missouri, so you got to show me first. That's how they. That's how people mentality is when they're getting something for free. What, what, what are you doing? <laughs> Very skeptical. So that's how they be. I have a question. Um, have you all had to deal with the ugly side of the literary world, you know, professional jealousy, social media scandals, or that rude reader or author? <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, it's, I, I, well, I, I don't want to put anybody on blast. That's not nice. You don't have to. You know, but, the but, story. But <laughs> I, I, I have, I've had people that, you know, I, I will say if I had a dollar for everybody that told me they would buy my book, my book would be a bestseller right now. Oh, and, we all would. And, <laughs> oh, yeah. and, and, and the funny thing is I've had people tell me, oh, I don't need to read your book because I already know what it says. Well, if you know what it says, then you wouldn't be – we wouldn't be having this conversation. You know, there is not much. I have, I have a, uh, a person I know I'm, I'm that, that told me, I know you, so I know what's in your book. And a lot of things that I've, I've, I've written in my book I learned while I was in the Air Force for 20-something years, and that person was not around me for 20-something years while I was in the Air Force. So there's no way they could know what was in that book. So it's like, I bet you don't know what's in it. <laughs> You know, so I get, I get those, I get those, I, I don't need to read your book, there's nothing wrong with me. Okay, well, I didn't say there was anything wrong with you, but there may be something wrong with somebody you know, you know, and that's the hard part, again, back to what I was saying before, a lot of people assume they know what's in my book until they read it, and once they read it, they go, you know what, your brain was working on a totally different level than what I expected, just by reading what you wrote. You know, you gave some thought about this. I, I, I wrote a chapter on relationships, and people thought I was nuts for attacking that pro, that, uh, that topic because it's like, oh, you're going to make some people mad. Well, how can the truth make you mad? You know, I'm not saying anything that anybody doesn't know. It's just not put the way that I put it. So I had a couple people read it. In particular, I, I sent it to my parents who have been married for 40 some odd years and both my mom and my dad read that chapter and they went you hit the nail on the head with that if everybody would read this a lot more people would understand the dynamics of a relationship (laughs) because I I actually I, I looked at it from a male's point of view from a man's point of view but I also looked at it to where a a what a man does and what a woman does to throw monkey wrenches into a relationship and then how to put everything back together. So that, that is kind of the ugly side, you know, where people go, I don't, I don't need to read your book. You know, you, you already know what you're going to say anyway. You know, you're going to say something's wrong with me. No, I'm not. I'm telling you something was wrong with me and here's what I did to fix it. So mm. I'm, I'm constantly, I'm constantly having to, reprove myself and that that's a that's an exhausting part it's like if you guys just read the book trust me you will not you will see things completely different because my brain works completely different I'm, I'm an individual you know we all see things differently but we have some of the sim- we have some similar experiences that go you know what I went through that too 
and I didn't know what to do. This dude, he went through it, and here's what he did, and it worked. Let me try that. And that's all mm-hmm. I'm trying to do, get people to look at things a little differently. Because what I tell people, my, uh, the mentor, the mentees that I, I do when I mentor young men, I tell them this, doing things the way you've done them has gotten you to where you are. Now, if you don't like where you are, why are you continuing to do things the way you've done them instead of mm-hmm. learning a different method? <laughs> that, that's true. It, that's insanity, as they say. <laughs> You're expecting something different, and you're doing the same thing. You, cannot, mm-hmm. you can't reasonably expect that. You have to do something different, even if it's just one little thing. And one of the things I put in my book, I said, if you don't like where you are, what you can do is stop where you are, make a slight turn, and start walking again. You are moving in a completely different direction than you originally were. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if yep. you look at it in that sense, it makes it, it makes things a lot easier to understand. But we keep trying to look over that that path we were just at and keep keep our eye over there. No, focus forward. That's where you're going. You're not looking off to the side. That's peripheral vision. <laughs> That's great advice. Great advice. I always say that. Moving forward, Lashonda. Moving forward, because if you spend so much time looking backwards, you're never gonna get to to the completion. <laughs> so, yeah, right. It's funny. It's funny you say that. One of my favorite sayings is, if you were supposed to focus on what was behind you, your eyes would be in the back of your head. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that is so point. true. So true. <laughs> what about you, Laura? Did you have any issues? Oh, goodness. Well, <laughs> one of the reasons I, I took a hiatus from writing in the 90s, I got very discouraged when I went to my first conference. And it was wonderful. I'm a so many fabulous authors. I can't even tell you. I want to say Walter Mosley might have been there. Uh, Sue Grafton was there. Max Allen Collins was there. Um, It it, it was amazing how many. Ellen, I think Eleanor Taylor Bland might have been there. And, you know, these are huge names in mystery. And I was starstruck. And I had a manuscript ready, bid several hundred dollars on auction night for an editor at a New York house to give me a line edit. He never did. I couldn't get my money back because it was a charitable donation, and it went Mm. to a public library who'd already bought books with it. So, you know, it was a charitable donation, and, you know, we got to write it off on our taxes. But in the meantime, I was supposed to get something that I thought would be helpful. And I, I was very disillusioned at that editor's behavior. And, of course, I reported this to the people in charge of the conference, and there wasn't much they could do about it at that point other than I doubt they ever invited that editor back. Um, I, I have noticed when I've been to conferences, and I've been to quite a few since then, most agents and most publishers are very kind to writers. Every once in a while, you get somebody who is just exhausted. I, I, I really think that's what does it. Agents go to conferences, and they will tell you horror stories. They'll tell you about being cornered in the, in the ladies' room or the men's room by an author who has followed them in there. Um, mm. Authors do all kinds of things trying to get agents' attention, and I think after a while they're just frustrated with it. And I have been in a couple of discussions where they're reviewing people's pages and the feedback has not been helpful, to say the least. (laughs) Um, I took Don't Fear My Darling to one of those when it was still in the stage where I was going to be sending it out to agents. And one of them slapped the pages onto the table and told me that she could not sell the book because my character has some Native American ancestry, and I do not. And I, I, I'd love to see that agent again, and I would smile very sweetly and say, remember that book you said you couldn't sell? I did. I sold it to an editor. <laughs> but, you know, of course you won't do that. And it, you know, it's a small business. The unfortunate thing about being the writer is that you have to pretend you're on a job interview. Um, I worked in the nonprofit world for quite a while back in my younger days. And the nonprofit world is a small one. 
And if you offend somebody, word will get out. And it's the same way in publishing. If you behave poorly, word will get out. The only thing you can do is be as, as much of a lady or a gentleman as you possibly can, no matter what. And move on. And then when you get home, you add that agent's list to your names of don't ever query this person ever, ever, ever again. Fortunately, <laughs> my do not query list is pretty short. Um, however, I, as, as a kind of a humorous aside, I mentioned something about that particular incident, and I did not even say the agent by name to one of the people who had worked with that conference. And she came, emailed me back and said, you were not the only one, and I will not be inviting her back. Oh, wow. So, you know, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it's, it's my, my thin skin, and sometimes it really isn't. I, I, I think sometimes they are just overwhelmed. So let's look at it that way and say a good person had a bad day. Well, yeah, I, I kind of agree. We all have bad days, yeah. but the way I look at things is if you're having a bad day, that doesn't give you an excuse to treat somebody badly. You I know, know. You, you, you know, it, it's, it's unfortunate know. that we do have bad days, and we all have them from time to time, but it, it's still, you're supposed to treat people with respect, you know, it, know. and that goes both ways, you know, yeah. so I, I, I kind of I get what you're saying, but I, I don't excuse that, you know, I've, I've had bad experiences being in the military for 20 years, mm-hmm. plus I have had many bad days, you know, but you still have a mission to accomplish. You know, mm-hmm. So it, it's it's one of those things. It's like the, what I say in my book, um, when I was in the Air Force, we had a mission to accomplish no matter how many or how big the obstacles were between me and the, the goal, I had to get there. And it was up to me to adjust my behavior to get around or over or through that obstacle that was stopping me from achieving that goal. So mm-hmm. that's the kind of the, the way I look at things. It's like you you have to be reactive to a certain degree. You know, you can't always be proactive. You know, you, you have to uh, adjust your behavior because you never know how uh, things are going to work out. One of the things I talk about in my book, and, and it's a, an important thing that I think a lot of people need to realize, is your approach dictates the tide of a conversation or a situation, not the reactions you get, because reactions are secondary to your initial action. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's cool. That's true. Well, we are talking about draining people. Um, I want to talk about um, some advice for writers because we know that it can be draining and stressful sometimes. So what advice would you give to an aspiring writer? How to overcome that? Okay, I'll go first. I mean, unless Laura wants to go go ahead. I, no, I, I no you, go, you go ahead. Okay. Well, for me, I mean, I, 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 was, I took the untraditional route. I decided to self-publish. Um, I, I didn't want to go through a, a big publishing company because I wanted to write. I wrote my book in a specific manner, uh, and I, I wanted it delivered a certain way. Uh, I wanted it to say a certain, convey a certain message. So for me, I would say uh, the, the best thing a, an aspiring writer can do is to start writing. And write all of your ideas down, get them down, and, and organize them later, you know, because you are going to have so many ideas in your head, and you never know which direction it's going to go. Um, for me, it was it started out as personal essays, you know, for personal growth for me, and it turned into a 250-page book. Um, and and I had people on the way telling me it wasn't a good idea. You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't. It it, it won't do this. If you if you're not J.K. Rowling, you're not going to sell books. You're not going to do this. You, it it was so many things. It was like it, it they were telling me that why I shouldn't do it, and I had to fight that with why I was doing it in the first place. You know, what was, I, what was my goal? My goal was to get people to look at things in a different manner. Um, for me, that, that obstacle was the people telling me I shouldn't do it. But my desire to be successful had to be stronger than that obstacle's ability to defeat me. So I had to overcome all of those things with my mindset. I had to keep my eye on the goal. And those obstacles were sitting there. I had to get around them. You know, I, I did I make some people mad? Obviously, you know, they but once I wrote the book they went, 
okay, congratulations, you 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 did something that you said you were going to do. Well, that's part of the, the that's part of the the challenge, you know. That's part of the reward, you know. I set a goal, I did, I made a plan, and I got after it, regardless of what was standing in my way. <laughs> You know, so though that's one of the things I would I would tell an aspiring writer: just start writing and forget all. Of, I won't say forget; that's not a good word, but um, take all of the criticism and if you still have that desire, keep moving forward. You know, because nobody is going to be able to tell you what's going to satisfy you. They they can only tell you what's going to satisfy them. And if you have a goal and they tell you you shouldn't do it and you don't do it, you've achieved their goal for them, not for you. <laughs> oh, that's powerful right there. That is so true because people <laughs> stop you. And, I call them dream crushers. They'll stop you because they're not living their dream. So they think right. you should exactly. live yours either. Yep. Exactly. Yep. And it's funny you mentioned that because I mentioned those people in my book. <laughs> yeah, I am not kidding. I am not kidding you. I mentioned it in my book uh, on the, the, the uh, on the chapter called uh, "Overcoming Obstacles." It's it, it the people tend to stop you, want to stop you from pursuing your dreams because they decided to to stop pursuing their own dreams. Mm -hmm. And what I say is, uh, I know we've all heard the, the term the uh, the saying misery loves company, right? <laughs> well, I have, a, I have a personal spin on it. Misery needs company. Right. right. <laughs> because if misery becomes the dominant emotion, it grows. But in a positive environment, it's impossible for misery to grow. That is so true. <laughs> so true. Thank you. That was really good advice. How that about is, you, Barbara? <laughs> Well, a couple of things. Um, obviously, I would tell people, please don't get discouraged. And I, I judge a contest, and I've been doing this for three years. And one of the things that I repeatedly tell the authors, most of them have a lot of work left to do. Um, I, every once in a while, I will see an entry that I expect to see as a published book not before too long. But a lot of people are about where I was, you know, before I – really learn the craft of writing. And I'm trying to be as helpful as possible to them. I want to be encouraging, but also steer them toward the path of this is how to do this better. And I tell them all the time, I gave up at one point because I got discouraged and I thought my writing wasn't good enough and I did this. And don't do that. Don't be me. Keep writing. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to keep submitting things. You might not have anything that's worth submitting for a while, right, anyway, because you get exactly. better by doing it. And, you know, it, yes. it, like I said earlier in the, in the podcast, it's, it's not being an athlete. You're not going to lose your skill as you get old. The older you get and the more life experience you get, the more living you've done, the more you actually have to say. And I found that with... Uh, some of my work I've been able to go back and do something really positive with a good idea that I had when I was younger and just didn't know what to do with it. And that brings me to my really important advice. Don't ever throw anything away. Do not throw your writing away. Keep every single thing you write. And, of course, now, you know, a lot of people don't keep things on paper. Don't delete it. Keep it, please, for the love of all that is holy. Keep everything you write because... <laughs> I can speak from experience. Until Proven Innocence first draft was written when I was 15 years old. Don't Fear My Darling's first draft was written when I was 25 years old. They weren't very good books. When I got older, I knew how to go back. I knew how to make the characters full people. I knew how to actually set up a mystery. Learning how to construct a mystery is really hard. You can't expect a 15-year-old who's been writing for four years to put together a good mystery. But at age 50, I could. <laughs> so, right, you know, right. You, you, you will always get better if you keep working on your craft and keep something because something that you wrote when you were 20 or 30 years old, years later you might look at it and say, hey, I could do something with that. And that might be the book that ends up getting published. 
That's interesting. I, I have things on my computer that I've written, and I'm, I'm, I won't say afraid. I'm going to say I'm, like, I'm hesitant to publish them because once I publish them, it's going to rub some people the wrong way. <laughs> so never, don't, don't be afraid of things, though. It, Lou Brock once said, you know, Lou Brock, the famous baseball player, <clears throat> yes. excuse me, once said, show me a guy who's afraid to look bad, and I'll show you a guy you can beat every time. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Listen to what the man said. He's a smart man, and in addition to being a really great baseball player, he's right. If what you're thinking about is offending as few people as possible, you are never going to realize your own potential. Makes sense. Yeah. Well, well, you probably offended people with this book. They didn't want to. They were telling you they don't need to read it. Oh yeah. <laughs> so don't and worry it's, about it's, it. You got to always yeah. offend somebody. And it, you it, know, it's, and it's, it's 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 interesting you say that because I've had people that didn't want to read the book, but once they read it, it was like, oh, this is not what I thought it was any in the mm-hmm. first place. Absolutely, mm-hmm. it wasn't mm-hmm. meant to be. You know, even the title is a metaphor. You know, mm-hmm. it's not about gambling at all. It's about changing your mindset. That's the odds I refer to is changing your mindset. You have mm-hmm. to do that. If you want to do something different with your life, you have to change the way you think. You cannot keep doing what you're doing and expect something different. That is the textbook definition of insanity. You right. <laughs> right. And what I tell people all the time, there's somebody out there that needs what you have to offer. And if you keep that Ooh, in your head, you will know. My goodness. That's, I you tell know, myself that all the time when I'm thinking, oh, this book sucks. It's never going to get right. And then I say, it's a reader out there waiting on this book, LaShonda. Get to it. Let me, let me tell you one the best advice I had as a writer given to me. This is, I mean, and I'm going to quote it. There are, they, they says, what I, what I heard from an author friend of mine, she said, Self-doubt is going to be part of the process of being an author. Mm-hmm. But keep this in mind. There are billions of people in, on the planet. Chances are one of them is looking for the, sto- the message your story has. Mm-hmm. And only you can write it the way you can write it. So mm-hmm. write it and get it to them. Mm-hmm. That's, that's that, what it that, that, that made all of, the chance, all of the change in that I needed right there. And mm-hmm. that's, so we're going to see those good. books on the, that's on your computer coming out soon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 oh, this has been really, I just love when my podcast just flows so smoothly. I want to thank you both for being a guest and sharing with us today. Please tell the listeners how they can contact you online. Okay, I'll let Laura go first. Thank you. Uh, people can get in touch with me uh, through my website, which is www.laura, L-A-U-R-A, Stewart, S-T-E-W-A-R-T, Schmidt, S-C-H-M-I-D-T, dot com. LauraStewartSchmidt.com. I also have a Facebook page, Laura Stewart Schmidt, and everything about how to get a hold of my books is listed there. Um, until Proven Innocent, uh, the contract ended. It is out of print but I still have some copies, so somebody could get that from me. Don't Fear My Darling is available from Black Opal Books, which is the publisher. Okay. And my, um, my, my, if people can get in touch with me through my website, www.kevineeastman, make sure you put the E in there, uh, dot .com. And I also have Facebook. Uh, I'm on there as author Kevin E. Eastman. Uh, you can look up the book. Uh, the book has its own web, uh, his, its own uh, Facebook uh, publish. Don't gamble. I think it is. Don't gamble on life improvement. I think it's the Facebook page for that. Um, the book is available on all of the major uh, online book retailers: Amazon, Kobo. Uh, Apple Books, there. it's on Barnes & Noble, and it's also available directly from my website if you would like it, get it that way. Um, there are, there's actually a free preview of my book on, on my website. I tell people I, I want you to be excited about reading the other part of the book. So I put the first 
two full chapters of my book on the website. The person can download it and read the first two chapters so they know what to expect. And I also list the topics that I talk about in the book as well on, a, on there. So a person can go, oh, this topic looks interesting. Let me, let me, let me get this book so I can read this part. You know, so it, it's, all, it's all about mindset. I, I'm trying to help people the way I was helped. Somebody gave me the knowledge. I'm trying to pr- provide information to people that may not have that knowledge. They may be going through what, I'm, what I was going through at one time. So those are there is available, available as well. I also have Twitter. I have Instagram. So it, I'm easily accessible on, on, in cyberspace. If you want to talk, um, share stories, um, ask questions, those type of things, I'm happy to interact with readers and supporters all the time. I hope what our guest shared today was helpful for you. I want to thank our sponsor, the Finding Joy in the Journey 90-Day Devotional. Check the show notes for the link to order your copy. I want to thank our listeners for taking time to listen to the podcast. I have three questions for you. One, did you enjoy this episode? If you did, subscribe to the platform you are listening to so you don't miss an episode. Number two, what did you think of the episode? Tell us by writing a review on the platform you're listening to or send to onesormeg at gmail.com. Three, did you learn something from this episode? If you did, please share the podcast with your community. If you have a topic or would like to be a guest or sponsor for our episodes, contact me at onesormeg at gmail.com. One last question. Have you promoted your book or business today? If you haven't, go showcase those wings. Someone needs what you have to offer. This is LaShonda Hoffman, and I'll see you on the net.